Okay. I, I think we'll get started. Can people out in Zoom land hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Loud and clear. Okay. Well, welcome everyone uh, to the RAS Halifax Center meeting for December. It's a combined meeting this month. We have both not only the members meeting, but we also have our annual general meeting, which I know everyone is really excited to be here and attend. Uh, just as a matter of note, that looking at the audience here in the room as well as out in uh, Zoomland, we do have forums, so we're good to go for the AGM. So thank you everyone for being here today. I want to make sure that folks are aware that Halifax Center does welcome anyone and everyone who has an interest in society in astronomy. That we accept you without prejudice. After all, the stars belong to everyone. If you want to uh, contact our president, who currently is John Nangreaves, or our subsequent president, you can reach them at president at .ca. And if you want to contact any one of the members of the executive, uh, please go to contact us, and you can there are email addresses there for the secretary, the treasurer, and other souls uh, that are. Chairs of appointed committees. I want to acknowledge the fact that the RAS Halifax Center respectfully acknowledges that we live and observe in the unceded ter territory of the Mi'kmaq people. The this is the general agenda for today. Uh, at one, well, we're a little late in starting. However, the annual general meeting will be first. And we'll be going till about 1.45. The hope is that we can get it, the, the AGM completed within half an hour. Um, in any case, we'll start the members meeting at 1.45 with a welcome and then our special presentation, followed by a 15-minute social break, and then um, the food for the soul, uh, followed by um, news from the board, and the what's up before we adjourn at 4. Next, please. Okay, so this is the AGM. We get the right screen here. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so this is the agenda, full agenda, for, for or at least the overview, on my apologies. Uh, but one thing that isn't included in this is the list of reports. But nonetheless, the AGM, this is the agenda. It comprises the welcome and opening remarks. When you see the word poll after each one of these, these are where um, what's I'm looking for. motions uh, to approve are made, and we already have those pre-established, so we'll, uh, we can very quickly put the polls up to approve those three items. The agenda still isn't corrected. Oh, it's the 2023 agenda, approval of the AGM minutes for December 3rd, 2022, and then appointment of the auditor for the uh, fiscal year 2023-24. Followed by the reports, and then you will see a, a full list in a moment. Uh, Greg will give his treasurer a re treasurer report, and we'll approve that, and then approve the written reports, and then there'll be nominations for both the board and the um, appointed positions, and then we'll adjourn by board. So I need uh, a motion to approve the agenda as circulated. And keep in mind these were circulated ahead of time to all members. Point of order? Yes, sir. <clears throat> I know that the people who are on Zoom uh, can be reviewed as to their membership status and whether they're entitled to vote. But maybe we should identify who in the room are members and not members for the purpose of if there's any votes. Uh, yes, I believe, uh, Peter, you have the full list, correct? Yep. Uh, so we're able to, then we can check uh, who online has voted. I know Not how they voted, but who? Not on one. Okay. I was thinking of the people in the room who, yeah. you know, some, some of them don't know. So. Okay. There are two non members in the room that I'm aware of. Okay. Well, if that's okay, well, if you now know who they are, that's fine. Two. One beside you. David? Yeah. No. Um, 
Okay. I don't want to cause you trouble. I just had I think it's been a long time since I've taken a picture class on my other class. Okay. okay. So Peter Filipponi, P F F I L L F I L I. Sorry. Okay, so is he a member? F-I-L-I? Okay. So then there are three members in this room and that uh, cannot vote. That's in this room can. Um, and to that point, those of you out in Zoom land, if you are not a member, please do not vote when we put up the polls. That would be with me. Uh, it's for members only. And members in good standing. Come out and phrase that. So in other words, your dues have to be up to your data and be current. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. So that reminder, I only had it here with double asterisks, but you know. <laughs> Nonetheless. Um, so we need a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Um, Paul Heath approved. Seconder. Okay. Okay. What was it? Um, Bob Russell seconded. Uh, Jerry, have you got the put the poll up, please, for those people in Zoom land? And we'll do a direct hand count here. They can find it. There we go. We're there. Okay. So the motion. Made by Paul Heath, seconded by Bob Huck, uh, Russell, is to approve the December 2nd, 2023 agenda as circulated. All in favor? People in Zoom land can vote. People here in the room, please put up your hand. I've already voted on that. <laughs> All right. All right, we'll give you uh, 15 more seconds in the Zoom land and then we'll close the poll. 100% I voted. Okay, we're going to close. All right, we'll close it then. So it is unanimously accepted. Thank you, one and all. The agenda is approved. The minutes of the December 2nd, 2020. Oh, Sorry. 10 of 16. I misread that. So 10 of 16 participated. I presume that was enough time. I hope that was enough time. You brought it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, there you go. Okay, thank you. All right. So in any case, we'll say it's a The minutes of the December 20, 2022 um, have been online for a year, and we also sent links to folks to access it when we set up the notification. Are there any errors or omissions of, uh, in the December 2022 AGM minutes? If not, again, members only. Uh, Jerry, if you do got that, um, uh, that's the agenda, but you uh, put up the. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay, this is behind. Um, the minutes of the December 2nd, 2022. I need a motion to approve. Greg Jill made a motion to approve, and I need a, a seconder to that motion. Paul Heath. Um, okay. All in favor. Can you launch it, please? I think it launched. <clears throat> I'm sorry? I have not seen anything online. Yeah, it's not enabled. That's the problem. It has been launched, so I want to stop. Okay, let's go back and launch. There we go. There we go. All right. Give people uh, 30 seconds. Somebody was thinking that song. Yes. <laughs> I don't even know what it is.
Is that Philo Jeffrey? It is. <laughs> Okay. okay. Good. All right. So we're one hundred percent there, and we have one hundred percent in this room. So the agenda from, or sorry, the minutes of December second, twenty twenty two, have been approved. Now the auditor for the twenty twenty two survey. Um, what of the auditor for the twenty twenty three twenty four uh, fiscal year? needs to be appointed. The board at this point has not selected uh, a nominee. And so we are opening it up to our membership. If there is anyone out there that has expertise in bookkeeping or auditing, uh, or has done this before for another organization, we would really love to hear from you. Uh, we do have an auditor for the 22-23 uh, fiscal year, but we do require one for the upcoming. So we are asking, on the floor at this point, um, are there any nominees for auditor for the 2023-24 fiscal year? Point, point of order, we have the situation a few years back. Um, is it still acceptable to postpone the nomination of the auditor to the beginning of January? The, the situation is such that if an auditor is not appointed at the AGM, the board can appoint it subsequently. Does it have to be before the first? No, it does not. No. But because the, the nominations for uh, the appointed position, in this case, will be um, it's an appointment, would not be uh, considered until January 2nd board meeting. By the newly elected board, so we would uh, have an opportunity to be more than Okay, so then I take this as um, I'll give you a correct name point of order here, but I will take it that the board will now go forward and seek out um, an auditor for the 2023 24 fiscal year and will be subsequently appointed by the board or the later board. Ah, wrong screen. <laughs> All right. There we go. Well, that would be then I'll go one more for this. There we go. There's the list of reports that have been pre circulated to everybody um, with the General announcement that this meeting is taking place. They, um, there are a couple of things to note. Uh, the auditor report for 23 or 2022 23 will not be presented today. Um, Dave Chapman, bless his heart, had agreed four days ago to take on that role. So we really couldn't expect him in four days to complete a, an audit. So Dave's report will be um, following it in the new year. Um, as will the uh, Deep Sky uh, Reserve report. And I did recognize um, this morning, this afternoon, just before the meeting started, that there's one report missing that will be uh, reported on later in, in the other notes, which we'll get to. And that's the webmaster. But there has been a lot going on this past year. And given it's a relatively new position this year, we forgot to add it to this list. So the webmaster. The deep sky preserve and the auditor's report will be reported in a subsequent issue of no notes. Um, but before we go on to uh, approve the reports as received, uh, I'm going to ask Greg to, to uh, do the financial report because it has changed since the um, list of the you no know, <laughs> the compiled list. When I'll be about the report list. So, uh, Greg, if you can come down now and do that, that'd be wonderful. That's what happens when you get an engineer to do a team count. Anyway, uh, this is our uh, comparative income statement for 22 23. And I just like to highlight some things in here that are 
uh, what contributed to the fifth was the this year last year. Uh, one significant thing is the membership fees, uh, which is different there's under $38. Oh, <laughs> on the app. <edge. laughs> It's different, $138. And both of the reasons for that was if you remember, there was a change in the uh, uh, center fees from $23 to $28. And that mill was left to uh, increase the uh, amount that they charged. So then that was, I think, for the previous year. So it showed up in, in the year 2022. So that's a significant difference. Uh, the other thing you'll notice, uh, we didn't have a uh, an old lease that we had income. Unfortunately, we had to give it all back. But uh, that's why this, because that makes a difference as far as uh, what, uh, what we made and what we didn't make. And then if you look at the expense side, uh, you'll notice that uh, uh, depreciation uh, has increased double. And one of the recommendations of the auditor last year was that. Uh, we had been depreciating our uh, equipment at 3%, and we recommended that we keep it 10%. So, and the difference. And then the other difference you'll see here is for the uh, Melvin's refunds and the expenses, which get back with those two others. So, and then you see in the bottom, we've lost $820. But if you look at depreciation, which is one of those. A lot of these things are uh, thousands of them. Then we've actually made a couple hundred bucks. So we are in the black instead of red, as long as you ignore the depreciation. Any questions on that? Yes. Uh, because I was involved in it, uh, the um, purchase of door prizes for Nova East, which didn't get given away. There should be in there somewhere, there should be expense for door prices for Nova East. Uh, so does that fit under one of those categories there? Uh, that would be, uh, well, what can be deferred to next year? I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying what should be done with it. I just well, would ask if, if, if the purchase of those items is reflected in the state. Uh, no, it's not. And the reason is, I didn't receive any of those. Well, that's a, that was my second question. Did I forget to send you my expenses? <laughs> <laughs> I would say. And, and actually, where it would show up, you show, notice that on the uh, revenue side, it's the old East Net. Yes, I understand. So I, I, show, I need to talk to Chris Young, because maybe oh. he was in charge. Or, he has all the stuff, okay, <laughs> which we will now give away next year. But both of us went out of pocket to get those things, and I, I have to talk to him about whether we are keeping a claim. Yeah, I couldn't find anything in my own financial records. So. Yeah. Well, okay, we'll, we'll just check that out. First. Maybe we didn't put put in claim. Yeah, and you know, it, I may have missed something, but uh, I'm not that, saying you did. Yes, yeah, no, no, that's fine. But I mean, I'll ask and, Chris because we kind of left it in his hands. Yeah. Yeah. So, but it should it should show up. Just a question for the Zoom members. Uh, can can you hear Dave Chapman's question? I, yes, I, okay, good. Apparently they could. Okay. Yes, uh, but Jerry, uh, Greg is very muffled. Is it just me? Uh, anyone else out there online who's having the same problem? No, he's very muffled, uh, just naturally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I won't go there. <laughs> yeah, it, he's not mus muscled here in the room, so uh, it's probably uh, some effect somewhere. Where's the microphone? Camera. I'm different than you. Can you stand both of them? I do. I stand beside the desk. What's that? I'm shorter, too. Yeah, <laughs> we're almost done. So uh, if you scroll up, then we'll talk about the balance sheet. So then this this uh, shows what our situation is uh, as of the end of the year, which was September 30th of 2023. 
So you'll see that we've got we've got more cash in the in the bank. We still have our investments, which is eight thousand dollars to four thousand dollars GRCs. Uh, we've had some some receivables. Uh, part of that is the uh, national dues that come uh, a year or a month later than what we actually they record them in. We record them, so that's what the difference is. Typically in the uh, account receivable. And then our library estimate uh, depreciated by 10%. And then our observatory equipment, which again is uh, depreciated by 10%. I think what I'm doing, I'm looking at the screen and then the next one doesn't put me up. Right? So uh, our accounts payable is uh, larger this year than last year by about double. One the main reason for that is that the eleven $1 hundred and ninety dollars that was in refunds for uh Melbourne East is in this because it wasn't made before the end of the fiscal year. And, and other than that, I, I think that if there's any questions, I can entertain them. I should. Can I make a motion to approve uh Treasury's report for 2023. Second. Yeah. Second. Oh, oh, uh, <laughs> Second. 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 Just so everybody else can see it here. Hi. Nine of sixteen. I think that's what was consistent. Yes. Um, thank you, woman. Also, up to the but thank you, Greg. Uh, I don't even label you for this, <laughs> even since it was circulated to the method. So I thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so let me go back to the. Uh, Presentation, please. Okay. There we go. So there's the list of reports. Uh, before we go to the approval process, are there any questions about the reports that were circulated about any of the content? Anything else there in Zoom there? All right. So, Jerry, if you would launch the Oh, actually, I need somebody to make a motion to approve the reports as circulated. Here in Zoomland. Okay, uh, Bob Russell moved. I need a seconder. Okay, thanks, Paul B. Okay, launch. It's launch. Okay, uh, all in favor is in the room for approval of the 2023 report as presented. Okay. I, I voted online. Yeah, I know there are two people that didn't vote. <laughs> so I'll take them as abstentions. No, I won't. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So, unanimous. Thank you very much, Greg. All right. So, all right, next slide. The next slide entails our election. Keep in mind that all, at this point, all nominations are still open. We will see them if there are any from the floor or out and zoom in. It requires a nomination and a seconder uh, for that nomination to go forward. Uh, as you can see from the list, our nominees for president are Tony McGrath, myself as vice president. Peter Hurley as secretary, Greg Hill returning, and Peter returning as secretary as well for his fifth from last year. So we'll be looking actively next year for his replacement. Treasurer uh, Greg Hill returning, Matt Dyer, Dave Hoskin returning as directors, John Andrews is coming in as a director, and Jimmy Wynott will be new as a director as well. You can see from the list we have two open positions. We are 
Great. We are open to further nominations for those two positions. Uh, but do keep in mind that according to our bylaw number one, um, we are required to have five to ten directors, and that includes the executive in that, but considered directors first. So we do have the required number, but we would like to have the full complement if at all possible. But there are members out there, and you and I do have, should be a member. I believe we stipulated that to be a member for at least a year before stepping forward as a member of the board to have a better understanding of how our center works before you come on, on the board. So, if there are any nominations out there, I'll open the floor to further nominations. First call. Second call, are there any further nominations? Third call, any further nominations? Judy, it's uh, Dave Robertson here. I'll put my name forward if uh, nobody else does. Lovely. Not David. nobody else puts my name, but nobody else puts it, their name forward, I should say. Thank you very much. I'll second that. Thank you, Peter. Peter will second that. Um, do we need all in favor? Probably not. Okay. No, I mean about Dave Robertson's nomination. Okay, so we have one of the directors' positions being filled by Dave Robertson. Thank you, Dave. All right. Uh, just to point out that uh, last year I was actually not the treasurer until I took over from Dave Lane as, as a break because other than that, I did five years. So this would be. Next year will be the first year of five years. Or That's right. Just, just if you so choose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unless we have another offer, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess we need a, a motion for nomination to close. I move that uh, the nomination for the board of directors is closed. Okay. Seconded. Thank you, Jerry. That was Paul Heath that moved it. Jerry seconded. All in favor. I think we have a closing of the nominations. Yeah. Okay, we'll give you up for about two minutes, about 15 seconds to respond. Okay, wonderful. So we have nominations closed. So there is no true election process to be had at this point. So congratulations on everyone. Uh, the new board has been selected through acclamation means. The incoming president, Tony McGrath, did you want to come and say a few words? Thank you. Hey everyone, I uh, just thought I'd take the opportunity to introduce myself to those ahead of that. My name's Tony McGrath. Um, I've been a member of the RBSC, I was trying to do the math. Some around some, some between 25 and 30 years, I'm not quite sure. Um, I came to astronomy incidentally through the RBC, so it's always uh, one of the things that they uh, came to the Northern East in the, in the 1990s. My wife and I had such a wonderful time that I thought this might be much better. So I'm going to have it. I'm a primarily a visual observer, a phone with four telescopes. I learned my observing again through the RBC and through St. Croix, so I have a great opinion for it. Observatory, it's really one of the wonderful assets of the center. So I'm very happy to uh, look forward to, very happy to take the position of president and look forward to uh, working with everybody in the new year. Thank you. Okay. Next up, um, yes, are the appointments. Now, keep in mind, the appointments are made by the board of directors. They are not an election process by the general membership. However, we do accept nominations um, from the general membership. And, you, and for any of the positions, even though there are names here, if somebody out there would, would like to be considered for any one of those roles, please let us know if you're interested. So for now, honorary president, Mary Lou Whitehorn. Mary Lou, when she agreed to take on the honorary president, Agreed to uh, accept it until 2024. So, this will, the coming year will be Mary Lou's um, 
last of five years in that particular role. We thank her greatly for that. The auditor, as I mentioned earlier, for 23-24 is open, so we do accept nominations for that. Uh, importantly, uh, excuse me, the DSP committee uh, chairs, Tony and Peter, are returning, have agreed to return. Have agreed to return. But basically, we're all returning. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll remain as the government's chair and as a national council rep. And Jerry has agreed to be a librarian and webmaster. We have added to the list, so that uh, we put a bit new in this one. Uh, Peter will be uh, chair of the nominating committee. Chris Young has agreed to retain his role as the chair of the Middle East uh, Planning Committee. Lisa, Ann, and John, thank you so much for accepting your, your renomination for the nominates. It's a wonderful job you two are doing. Dave Poston is assuming his double role again for PPO as well as uh, jury committee chair, and John Lagarde will be made as school manager. So, uh, if anyone is interested, like I said, in any one of these roles, or you have a suggestion, or would like to volunteer to be auditor for the 2023, we are open to it. The appointments will be made at the January 2nd board of directors meeting. So, if the court is interested, Please let us know before that, before uh, 7 p.m. on January 2nd when the board meeting happens. So that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Um, Just before you go on, uh, as librarian, uh, if somebody else wanted really to do that, I'd be happy to let them do it. I'm finding it hard to, uh, to do both at once. Uh, really getting the card out uh, and putting it back is not difficult, but it's just, uh, it it is a I haven't been doing it. There is a uh, the mini Ralph is in the way right now, and I haven't actually got that mood switched around. So we we can't actually just roll it out. But uh, if there were people interested, I could help them with the uh, website of the uh, library holdings. Very just for clarification, the the I know you do the stuff on the web, but is what you're doing right now part of the webmaster? I have no idea. Okay, just ask her. Traditionally, it hasn't. No. Well, we've only been doing it a few months, but I mean, well, the point is, I'm sympathetic to the fact that you're doing a lot. Traditionally, it's Dave Lane's job, so that that was the yeah. classification. Okay. That's Dave's so, job. Anyway, I'm not saying that I'm sympathetic to your position, and I think that a new librarian should be sought. Yeah. Can I make that a motion? With that volunteer motion? <laughs> no. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Yes, we can make that motion. I, I I move that the board uh, actively research an appointment for the library librarian position. Second. <laughs> Story of laughing folks up there who like Jerry put up both his hands. <laughs> uh, Greg, okay. Okay. Um, we don't have a poll for that, so no. Um, do, hopefully, people out in Zoom land can raise their hands. Can you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, they could probably do that. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the motion? Unanimous here. Um, I, I I only see two of yeah. well, the majority of <laughs> the members that are here. Okay. Three, so, three yeah. Okay. Four, four raised hands. <laughs> okay, anyways. It's passed, so we will pass it. You reckon? That would be an action. Yeah, yeah. That'll be an action for the board uh, from January. So uh, that concludes the business of the AGM. Um, we need a motion to adjourn. Thank you, David talk. Hoskin. Oh, sorry, somebody on the green line? All right. Um, seconder? 
Bob Russell. Closed. Thank you, one and all. Um, so that concludes the AGM. I'm now going to hand it over to Dave Hoskins, who's going to take charge as MC of the uh, members meeting. So thank you. The library. I think I'm ready. Okay. So welcome everyone to the uh, December members meeting. Um, we'll start off with the photo uh, montage. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. <laughs> uh, so, unfortunately, November was uh, not a, a great month for imaging. We had a few new nights. Um, it's not as long as I could do. Now, we, fortunately, we did have a really nice early morning side uh, where the uh, moon, Venus, and Junction campus is. Uh, Everybody's waiting to admit to the Gary Black morning walk. The moon and Venus very close together. No, maybe not. <laughs> um, and another nice shot of the Gary that would be early morning, November 21st. Brain, but between the branches of the And uh, this was activity at Skull on November 16th. Uh, so uh, a number of members made it out uh, and were busy uh, imaging. Uh, see four telescopes uh, in, uh, in action. And uh, hopefully, we'll see more of that uh, in the new year. And this is from Beauty Black. Uh, the moon uh, acting as a counterweight for a uh, crane. Imagine this shot. <laughs> that happens when you look out a hospital window. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next one, please. Uh, Michael Bocca, uh, this was his uh, photo of the moon Venus conjunction on the uh, morning of November 9th, uh, taken out of uh, a window in his apartment, I guess, please. And uh, Michael saw this uh, lovely colors here, this uh, image of the crest moon, November 16th. Uh, sky. Uh, and uh, not quite for quarter moon. Another image by uh, Michael. Uh, yeah. And some thoughts. Uh, using his. Uh, it's not a lot of reflector, as you said. It's been quite accurate, though. And we said on the moon 2088. Barry Burgess uh, caught this image of uh, early moon in the studio. Two days ago. And Dave Jackson. I'd mind to look up in the sky for a new Venus conjunction while we do not <laughs> I was very careful about the no pun No pun intended. This is a really neat one. Uh, this new set. Uh, we encourage everyone to go to the uh, RAS Facebook page because I grabbed this with screenshot off a video, but you can actually close to that uh, video showing uh, <clears throat> Comet Hong Brooks and Comet LP. On November 21, and this is a comet's uh, been quite active. It's, it's uh, had a number of uh, trial volcanic outbursts, and uh, if you look carefully, you can see a faint line coming away from the nucleus. That's one of the uh, more recent outbursts, I think, that's four or five. Uh, but really nice shot from Tim set. And uh, I noticed the galaxy up here, NGC 6580. Nice shot. Uh, Lisa Ann Fanning, uh, image of the moon Venus conjunction on November 9th. Again, uh, lighthouse here and the moon Venus in the corner. 
Uh, this is Marsha with the Indies Convention on November 9th. It's really beautiful to the night. It's really all captured. It's not really And I had a question for you. Uh, you know, with the Green Combat on November 16th. Um, that's kind of it's in a bird Ah, Kiko and one of the sprayers captured the middle of the month. So there's a so lunar highway there is kind of looking pretty. And uh, I think there's a great red spot that I ran for this. November 26 was apparently a good day to look at sunspots. Uh, I also uh, this oldest uh, filtered image. This is the Canadian meter magnetic uh, refractor for this one. And uh, well, star clusters in Cassiopeia. Uh, there are five uh, open star clusters in this uh, particular image. Uh, this is uh, Messier 103, I believe. And uh, I'm actually surprised that. Uh, Let's see you pick that one rather than this one because these bigger stars. Is the uh, one below that one or three? Is that a, is that a, this one? The two, it looks like two. Buttons. It's actually a line of, of five stars. Uh, and and this, that one's called Truffler One. No, I'm just wondering, it looks like a two little tiny clusters sort of joined together. Oh, I see. Is it here and here? Is that considered one? Or? Uh, I think it's considered two clusters. Thank you. Uh, what are they called? Uh, the Blue and Nebula. Here. And down the sea. Uh, in the uh, moon, I think it's not quite first order. Uh, it's on, on the 19th of November. And the next one, the other one from John, uh, April to Lunar Green, we held this uh, cell phone. Uh, the odd piece. And, uh, well, this image of uh, of the uh, Caucasus Mountains, see the uh, Alpine Valley. Okay, you can do a lot of that stuff just holding a cell phone up to a cluster. Need a tutorial on that sliding that cell phone. It doesn't work. Oh. <laughs> that makes it easy. Yeah. <laughs> know what I want to talk about something? Yeah, just tell Jerry that's that's. <laughs> I'm not used to standing still before I need to stand it. Please. Thank you uh, for the offer to uh, speak this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to visit yet another RASC center. I've been in another of the RASC since 68. So if you do the math, that puts me well into like 20 pounds. Uh, first of all, Lowell has always been a fascinating person to me. Uh, it's uh, been in astronomy for a long time. I've learned every type of telescope you can own. Uh, those astral images were amazing because I am the world's worst astral photographer. I know my limitations and I'm not producing photographs like that. Uh, but first of all, to me, he's an unsung hero because he has shaped our society in ways that you can't imagine. If you go out and ask some of these students who, uh, who Hawking is, they'll say, oh, he invented black holes. Well, how about Einstein tomorrow? He invented relativity or something. How about first of all, oh, so I look at you like, I don't know, you know, from what was the past three years back guy? And yet, he has driven much of our science fiction and fiction and just our world events for the past century. People haven't really heard of him, unless you're in the All because of his belief in a civilization on Mars. So, next please. Uh, Principal Lowell, among other things, was an honorary member of the RASC. He was made a member in 1916. Of course, he died in 1916. I don't think there's any causal connection between those events. It was bad timing. But uh, he was born into wealth. He was a Boston gentleman. His family owned all cotton mills, his father and grandfather. So he was born into privilege. He had a brother and two sisters. He didn't really have to work. He was just a he was a son of privilege, very quiet man, devoted pacifist. And uh, I'm going to try to convince you that although history has painted him as either the world's worst observer or a lunatic, he was neither one of those. Uh, as I'll show you hopefully in the next uh, the next four to five hours. 
What does Mars look like today? Uh, we have knowledge now of another century's worth of data that he certainly did not have. We know, uh, sorry, I'm moving around. I'm used to walking around, so I'll probably go on my camera. Mars today looks basically like this to, to uh, orbiters and telescopes. We know that about up to about 3 billion years ago, it had water. It probably had a sea that covered half the planet. It could have been 100 feet deep. But being a small planet, the iron core settled down very quickly. It lost its magnetic field. And once it lost its magnetic field, of course, radiation stripped the atmosphere off and made short work of the oceans or the seas, probably in the course of only a few million years. It wouldn't take very long at all. So we know that now, but first of all, it certainly didn't. And so where did he get the idea that there was a civilization on that planet which drove our modern society? Well, I'm going to show you. It came in a series of steps that any logical person might have followed. Next, please. It starts with William Herschel. William Herschel became the first person in modern times to discover a planet. He discovered Uranus. But he looks at Mars and sees something dramatically that looks like our planet. It has polar caps, and that's what Herschel notes. Hey, this isn't just a little point in the sky that we see get brighter every two years and it's red. This thing looks like Earth. It has polar caps on it. So that sounds simplistic now. This is 1822. This is two centuries ago. That was pretty revolutionary at the time. Next thing. Then we have these two German observers, Beer, I think it's called Beerbaum, because it's got a name in it, but Baron Midler, they were using a four inch telescope. They made very, very, very detailed maps of the moon, which were remarkable for the time, especially using a four inch refractor. They also turn their attention to Mars, and lo and behold, they see more than just polar caps, they see markings. They make no comments as to what the markings are, the deserts or seas. They just simply map them. They were very dedicated cartographers, as you can tell. And this is what they produced for the scientific community. Next, please. Then along comes somebody from the Vatican Observatory. Now, the Vatican Observatory came a long way since the days of persecuting Galileo. It became a very dedicated uh, observatory. And Father Secchi here, uh, a bad pun, he becomes the father of astronomical spectroscopy. Um, I'll try to avoid the bad puns for the rest of the lecture. But <clears throat> he turns the spectroscope on the stars and he determines something that's revolutionary. It seems to be now it's revolutionary at the time. He realizes that our sun is no different than the rest of the stars in the night sky. He looks at the spectrum and says, Our sun isn't any different than anything else that we're looking at at night. Pretty profound. Let's see if it's in between the Vatican. I'll slide you back to you. But he reports channels. He sees channels on Mars. He doesn't call them canals. He's just reporting what he sees, but he sees features on the planet Mars. Next, please. Along comes another Italian observer, Schiaparelli. Um, now he comes right out and says, this is a wet planet. He thinks he's observing seas with all sorts of channels or canali, or however you say it properly in Italian. That gets misquoted in the American media as canals. Okay, well, he was trying to say channels, just water, channels of water, but he wasn't trying to imply that they were built by intelligent human beings. But when he thinks about it, he does think that there is a possibility that there is some intelligence behind it. He doesn't come out and say Martians, he just says maybe there is some intelligence on this planet. So this idea is always circulating around in the days of Lowell, but this is way before Lowell had the slightest bit of interest in the topic. Next, please. Next comes Charles Yacht, an American astronomer. And he just makes the note that not only are there features on this planet, the features change. If you observe this planet from opposition to opposition, things aren't always exactly in the same spot. He doesn't go into any detail. He's not a cartographer. But again, here's the next little step in the evolution of what's happening with the study of Mars. It has polar caps. It has seas. It has channels. There could be intelligence. Most features change. Is it seasonal or is it being driven by intelligence? Hard to say. Next, please. <laughs> this is the turning point in the study of Mars, Flammarion. He writes a book called The Planet Mars. He adds this picture of these purposely built <clears throat> canals to his book. And guess who reads that book? First of all, Lowell reads it while he's in Korea, or Japan at the time, hard to say. He was also an RASC honorary member. But this guy, Flammarion, actually turns the tide. He takes it from an inert planet floating around in the solar system next door to us as there's somebody on that planet building these channels. 
and actually publishes a book to that effect, which can't be read by other people outside of the scientific community. And the people, one person who reads it who gets really, really excited about it is Percival Lowell. Next from the set is Dr. Pickering. Pickering becomes a very dedicated uh, sidekick to Percival Lowell for the rest of Lowell's life. He is a very, very smart man. He's an MIT grad. He studies, uh, he discovered the ninth and tenth moons of Saturn. As a very, very young man, he predicts that the brand new aircraft that had been invented were at some point going to be used as bombers to destroy cities. Not an astronomical statement, but he's a smart man. He's an MIT grad. He gets a few things wrong. I mean, if I had a dollar for every scientist who got something wrong, I'd have a big pot of dollars here. He thought he was seeing vegetation and insects on the moon. Okay, you got to throw him a bone for that. So he made a mistake. But he gets a lot of other things quite right. And as I said, when he studies Mars, he sees not only lines on the planet, but he notices that there's black nodes where some of the lines are set. And Lowell will see those as well. But Lowell wasn't the first one. Dr. Pickering is the person who sees there seems to be some connections between some of these things on Mars. Next, please. So, here's Percival. He goes to Harvard. He's in Boston, Massachusetts. He's from Privilege. He goes to Harvard. His brother actually becomes president of Harvard. You know that? He does a math degree, graduates with honors, and you can tell he's a math uh, major because no matter what book or anything he reads, boy, does he like to put math in it. It doesn't matter what he's talking about. He could be talking about the meeting. He has a little calculus built into it somehow. That was his role of thing. He liked math. He was a valedictorian in his graduating class, but he didn't get a lecture. He didn't give a lecture on math. He gave a lecture on the nebula hypothesis about the solar system's origins, which was not in vogue at that time. Lowell was a very, very smart man. Because of the family, he ran a cotton mill for six years. He had zero interest in the cotton mill. He just did it because that was what the family business did. He becomes appointed by the U.S. government to be an ambassador to Korea, which he does. And he's a polymath. He's not only good at math, he's good at history. He can speak four other languages. Fluently French, Latin, Korean, and Japanese, of all things. Those are not easy languages to pick up. And he gets the bug after he reads Lemurian's book. And so he buys a six inch refractor. I started with a 2.4 inch refractor from Newton's. He starts with, a, with an Alvin Clarkson son's six inch refractor. Top of the line. He doesn't buy a department store or anything. He buys top of the line, custom built. He also has access to the 15 inch refractor at Harvard University. That helps too. I've never looked to a 15. I had access to an 8 inch refractor at the university that I went to, and I thought that was awesome. So he spends two years living in Tokyo just because he's fascinated, and I'm going to come back to this later, fascinated by Japanese culture. But he comes back to America, gets a refractor, and almost immediately orders a 24 inch telescope to be built, which is built within a year by Alvin Parkinson. Um, after reading Lemurian's book, He's very convinced that there's a culture on Mars, that there's a living civilization on Mars that's involved in possibly something, irrigation, canal building. Next please. So, financed out of his walking around money, as Jeff kind of would call it, he builds a 24 inch refractor, which is part of the Lowell Observatory today. He has no government funding. This is just out of the spending money he has this thing built. Very, very quick. Now, is he a bad observer? Pardon. He publishes over 20, or sorry, over 200 scientific papers on everything. The moons of Jupiter, the moons of Saturn. I won't even read you the list. The last one I want to point out, the location of observatories. He is the first astronomer in history who decides you just don't build an observatory on the campus. University of Chicago, let's build an observatory over there. Why? It's probably the worst place on the planet to build an observatory. Sure, there was no lights, there was no electricity yet. But still, if you're beside the mountain range with downdrafts and oceans and everything else, that's not where you put your observatory. But that was the tradition then. You built your observatory right there. He decides that's ridiculous. You shouldn't build it there. You should find a location, let's say on the other side of the continent, Flagstaff, Arizona, and build it there. And that's where Dr. Pickering comes in. He hires Dr. Pickering, who I just discussed, to come and locate the observatory for him. So Pickering picks Flagstaff, Arizona. I searched Lowell yesterday on the NASA database, the Astrophysics database, 220 papers. There was a bit of an error there because apparently there's another observer right now, another astronomer named P. Lowell. I don't know if it's a descendant of his son because 
person who didn't have any children. So it could be a direct descendant, I'm not sure. I didn't have time to suggest the afternoon to look into that. But I got 220 books and papers written by this guy. Was he a bad observer? No. He was a meticulous observer who wrote all sorts of serious scientific papers. His other real love was a search for uh, random Neptunian planets. He devotes a lot of his time to looking for those next planets that he thought were still hiding. So even though the observatory was only built in 1894, he writes a book by 1895 on the topic of Mars. In this book, he doesn't just talk about Mars. He postulates that looking at the night sky, he figures we're not the oddity. He figures there's a, there's a solar system around every single star that he sees out there. Other people have thought that too, but some of them got burnt at the stake for saying that. He got away with saying it. Um, whatever. But he makes a comment that I found very interesting. We cannot seriously take ourselves to be the only minds in the universe. That was a pretty profound and dangerous thing. Still to say in that time, because when he said that, and it got picked up by the media, there was some backlash from the church that weren't really excited about that opinion. Yes. You got to remember, this is the 1890s, it's not the 2023s. So he deduces that there is an atmosphere on Mars, perhaps it's thin, maybe it's one seventh the thickness of our atmosphere, but that's not even close, of course. But Dr. Pickering, his assistant, concludes they're looking at a, a desert. This must be a desert planet. That must be the explanation for the channels and the things that you see. It's probably a drying out planet. And uh, so Lowell pieces this together. You notice the dark circles. Other observers have noticed that sometimes when these lines meet, there's dark circles. Are these real features? We'll come back to that. But this is all in his, set, in his first book on Mars. And this, of course, is not a scientific treatise. It is a general book that anybody can buy. You can find it at the library. And just for interest, you can still get these in reprint. All of his publications are available. You can get them on Amazon for 20 or 30 bucks. The originals are still floating out there. If you go to sites like Biblio, yeah, the originals are a little pricier. They're 600 to 1,000 US, but they're beautiful books. If you can get your hands on one, they're outstanding books. Next, please. So he spends a lot of time, all of his time, as a matter of fact, observing Mars, and he comes to the conclusion that these cannot possibly be natural features because some of these things are double. He gets the impression that some of these lines are actually double canals that are crisscrossed in the planet. That cannot possibly be a natural formation that has to be built by intelligence. So some of the other astronomers, of course, around the world start studying Mars, and they're saying, you're out of your mind. There's nothing on the planet. We don't see this. But Lowell dismisses it, saying, yeah, well, look where you put your observatory. It's beside a factory. We're building on pollution. Mine doesn't live in the desert. But he stands his ground. He says, well, I don't care. You, you, you can't, can't see it. My people here at my observatory can see it because we've got a great instrument in a great location. Well, it's a good argument. And he's smart. He says, look, I don't for one second try to tell you that you're actually seeing the canal. That's impossible. Physically, you couldn't possibly see that mural over long. What we're seeing is the vegetation growing along the edge of the canal. And that's probably spreading for many, many, many miles. Um, well, please. And again, at the bottom, I'll fold it here. If Brown and Keith is anything, man will never find his level anywhere. We're destined to discover any number of cousins scattered throughout the universe. So he's standing the ground saying, I don't think these are human beings, but somebody there is building these things. Next week. Well, who picks up on this is the author H.G. Wells. Very, very quickly. H.G. Wells wrote Adventure in Science Fiction, neither of which is true. They were political statements. Before the world starts with a political statement about the United Kingdom having a colonizing people by force. Or what we get from that story, which has become a modern story, is usually when we need a superior culture, the superior culture wins, which is why some people don't want to broadcast our signals into space. It's maybe the meeting wouldn't go very, very well in our favor, but it's another story for another lecture. H.G. Wells writes The War of the Worlds. And where do they come from? From the dying planet, Mars. They're studying our oceans. They're jealous of our atmosphere, so they come and get us. Feeds right into the culture. I mean, if you weren't reading the, the, the scientific publications of Lowell, you certainly read H.G. Wells and his stories. So everybody starts to pick up on the theory of there's a big civilization right next door to us. Isn't that cool? As long as they stay there and don't come and be humans. Next, please. But this leads to even more criticism. Unfortunately, the ongoing criticism, 
criticism. Because Lowell was a very gentle man, he's a pacifist, a dedicated pacifist. He doesn't take the criticism very well year after year. He actually suffers a nervous breakdown. And for a while, he stops at a very much. His observatory theory is on, but he actually shuts down for a while because he starts to doubt himself. Everybody's saying, I'm a, I'm a lunatic. Maybe I am. I don't know. So it doesn't, it doesn't bode well for him for a little while, but he does pull out of it. Then the American evolutionary uh, biologist Wallace writes a couple of books, Man's Place in the Universe, where he clearly states, this guy's a wackadoodle. The only place in the universe that has life is here. It's nowhere else. I mean, that was a very simple view to take in those days because there was no food or other solar system. And he writes another book, Is Mars a big book? No, it's too cold. The atmospheric pressure is too low to sustain water. So this other observer must be a lunatic. You know, that criticism, I don't know if it's fair, but it wasn't very nice in that case. Anyways, Lowell gets back up on and running. He writes another book, Mars is now 1906. And here he puts in very detailed observations, which very accurately reflect photographs that are taken by Oberlis. He sees the changes in the polar caps, which he thinks is frozen water. They have not frozen carbon dioxide, obviously. But this proves what a meticulous observer is. His pictures are the resection of the polar caps during the seasons, the onset of summer. It doesn't look any different than the orbital photographs. So you can't convince me that he was a bad observer. He was the opposite. He was a phenomenal observer. He gets a few things wrong, though. I mean, he incorrectly determines that there's very little topography on Mars, that there's no hill higher than 3,000 feet. And he does a lot of math. Uh, he gets some of the math wrong because he starts figuring out what the air speed, air speed might be on, on Mars. It wasn't very much air speed. If you've seen the movie The Martian, when that you know, storm hits the spacecraft and the spacecraft is tipping over, there's not enough air pressure. You can easily just stand there and go, you know, do a wind blowing. Yeah, carry the dust, but it's not going to push anything over. Next page. So he doesn't have any way of knowing that there are enormous mountains at Olympic Mons, 22,000 meters high, not 22,000 feet, 22,000 meters. That's a really big mountain. The Lowell can't tell that. But he's very careful of not letting other, other people jump on the bandwagon. Other observers start saying, hey, we're seeing these flashing lights coming from the, sur the surface of Mars. Maybe the civilization is trying to, to signal us. Lois says, what flashing lights? There's no beacons on Mars flashing us. What they probably were seeing was the occasional uh, formation of frost on some of those high mountains. That was possibly being picked up by people as beacons. But Lola doesn't take ridiculous arguments to support himself. He just looked at the beacon story and said, no, no, that's not happening. Let's stay in reality. We'll just stick with the Martian digging trenches, but they're not, they're not using any flashing lights to signal us. Next week. So Lowell is absolutely convinced that his main argument for intelligence is the fact that these surface features that he sees are strange, they're linear, so they can't be accidental, and the fact that they're double, too. Using his observations, and he does all sorts of very, very intricate tests out of the sky staff where he sets up wires and they look at wires in the distance. So he does a lot of angular tests to decide how fine a line can I see using the telescope, let's say at one mile. And then he does the extrapolation to how big would that line appear to be on Mars. Uh, immensely boring stuff to read, but he does these tests to work on his theories. And he comes to the conclusion that. What he's seeing is somewhere between three and 45 kilometers of width. Again, other observatories at this time are getting even more critical, saying your telescope is out of focus or you're simply using your imagination because we can't see it. Okay, but he stuck to his ground and he said, as a matter of fact, another proof of his intelligence is at least one out of every eight of these canals is a double canal. There's no way this is an accident. Next week. He calculates that as the poles melt and these Martians on their dying planet are trying to get the water to the equator, it's traveling at about 2.1, 2.1 miles per hour, and that the transit takes 55 days. So he's not just pulling numbers out of his ear, he's doing some very hard math based on his observations. And he actually estimates that these structures cover 55 million square miles of the surface. That's a big excavation project. 
I'll come back to some of the investigations why they're so early. So therefore, intelligent beings have to be creating this next piece. He writes another book in 1908, Mars is the Abode of Light, where he actually sums up his material of the past 10 or 15 years. He calculates that he's observed 437 different independent channels, plus another 113 that were reported by Shiaoyo. Um, he does understand that sometimes the entire visibility of Mars is, is occluded by uh, dust storms, which still happens today. But he concludes, he concludes, and he writes another book on this shortly, that the civilization is doomed, that they're fighting a losing battle, trying to move this. The, the carbon dioxide cycle in Mars is very complex. It does move from the north to the south pole and back again as Mars goes through its summer and winter, just like Earth. But he concludes that they're fighting a losing battle, taking the water of the polar cap to keep the vegetation alive, that they have no chance of winning. Of course, H.G. Wells liked that because he had the deadline for the story. Next page. And as I said, pick up any article, any research report, or any book written by Mobile. And you'll get page after page after page of integral calculus. If you love integral calculus, you love Christopher Lowell. If not, you can skip it because he doesn't make anything to hover on this. He'll tell you what it means and then he'll tell you the answer. Next page. So things have any in a wall. When the six inch reflector comes online from Mount Wilson, because now it's the biggest observatory on the planet, and the observers there said, We don't see any stinking canals. Well, that causes a big scientific debate. Who was right? All these guys at one observatory who were supported by some people, or the people with the big toys? Lowell doesn't like what he hears, but he sticks to his ground. He doesn't change his opinion. He just says, well, I'm sorry you can't see them. We can. As a matter of fact, we're taking pictures of them. We're going to discuss them. We're photographing them. I don't know why you can't see them. We've got photographs. Next piece. So that's Giannotti in France, who was a very good friend of Flamerius, was a big supporter of Percival Lowell, but this shows a little paradigm shift that starts to occur. Uh, after the 1909 opposition, he, did, he decides I'm not so convinced anymore. I don't think those canals are there. So now there is a bit of a break occurring in the scientific community. Next, please. In 1910, Lowell writes another book. Now, this is also still available. I just picked up a copy of this off the internet for 75 US. I think the book had ever been read. So these books are still floating around in pristine condition if you search hard for them. And Lowell's Lowell says in 1910, we've entered the age of spectroscopic man because they started using the spectroscope around 1903 and Lowell Observatory, which I'll talk about in a second. And again, even in this book, which isn't just a discussion of Mars, it's a discussion of the entire known universe, the solar system. And Lowell says, what we're seeing here is kind of standard evolution that takes place. Mercury has already died. Not sure what's happening on Venus. We're okay here. We've got a stable atmosphere and radioactive field, which maybe no one didn't know about. But Mars, unfortunately, is suffering the same fate as Mercury. It's going to look like Mercury soon as part of the evolution of worlds. But his opinion was the spectroscope is going to put to rest all of these arguments sooner or later. That's what he said. And Lowell was a firm believer, well, not a firm believer. He had already spoken about perhaps our solar system was born out of a nebula, a nebula hypothesis. No one was buying it in those days. Everyone bought the Chamberlain Moulton theory, which was stellar collision. There was nothing else to compare it to. Thousands of exoplanets, what we know about now, didn't exist then. There was only, at that time, seven planets. Eight, you know, Neptune was a star, I'm not sure. But the rating theory was a solar system arises out of the collision of two stars, and that material gets pulled off and forms a planet, which, of course, does not actually happen. But that was a popular theory at the time. And, uh, Using the spectroscope, Lowell looked at the sun and said, I don't think we can form planets out of what I see coming out of the sun, but that's just me. Unless that collision took place between a sun and a dark sun. Now, what's he talking about? What's a dark star? Well, yes, Einstein and Hawking talked about the black holes. But before that, back in the 1790s, Reverend John Mitchell presented a paper for the Royal Society on the possibility of stars creating so much mass and getting so enormous that finally gravity would pull light back into it and they wouldn't emit light anymore. And these gigantic, enormous stars would be called dark stars. 
Noel was very well read. So his opinion was, okay, if anything collided with our sun, specifically, maybe it was a big dark star. But I don't think it was, even in the center of our galaxy, I don't think stars would be hitting each other. So this is the sort of thing that he put his mind to. He just wasn't observing Mars. He was observing a lot of different aspects of astronomy. He turns the spectroscope Supernovas were occurring. He picks up on a supernova in the early phases of its demise, and he realizes, hey, the spectra is really interesting. Looks like something cataclysmic is happening here. So his observers at his observatory were doing cutting edge research. No one else has really looked at Nova or supernova with the spectroscope, but he did. And he realizes there's at least two types of nebula the amorphous nebula that seem to be somehow connected with the supernovas. And these other things, these structural nebula, because nobody knew that they were independent galaxies yet. Except for one of his staff members, Vessel Slifer. Vessel Slifer was his number one go-to guy. He took 25 of these structural nebula and put the spectroscope on it. Now picture the state of film in around 1903. If you have ever done film photography, it suffered from you know exponential logarithmic failure, whatever you used to call it. Film was horrible. And especially if you're photographing a tiny little spectrum, to capture one spectrum of one structural nebula, Vesta would have to guide the telescope for eight to 10 hours to an accuracy of one tenth of a millimeter. So imagine not taking a bathroom break for 10 hours, to be guiding that telescope manually for eight to 10 hours. And his opinion, which he expressed to Lowell, was every one of these structural nebula is moving away from us. Either that or we're moving away from all of them. Because the light's being shifted, it's being red shifted. I know Edwin Hubble discovers the expanse of the universe in 1929 with a constant named after him on a big telescope. Funny because Vessel Slifer discovered it at Lowell Observatory. George Lemaitre, just after that, also discovers it. And so Hubble discovered that two other people had already discovered it, so it's just that that's neither here nor there. But again, this is a this is an example of what was happening at Lowell's observatory. They were doing some serious research. Next picture. Now, people thought Lowell had some crazy ideas. Dr. Campbell, the director of the Lick Observatory and president of the University of California, publishes his own theory on Mars. And I can't even make this up. He decides that Lowell is covered by one gigantic intelligent vegetable. And the vegetable has this gigantic eye. Again, I couldn't make this up. I think it doesn't matter what I smoked. I couldn't make this up. This gigantic eye stretches out into space now and then, keep an eye on the planet before it retracts. Where did he dream this up? I don't know. We can't even blame Lowell for this one. But this is the sort of thing that grows out of this craziness at the time. And this is put out as a serious theory. And not only that, he keeps his job as president of the University of California. I digress slightly with that, but I had to share that. Next. So World War I breaks out in 1914. Lowell again goes into depression. He can't believe that human beings are actually marching towards a conflagration voluntarily just because of the breakup of the austerity of Austria and Hungarian Empire. He couldn't understand why millions of people would want to go to war with anything, never mind that. So he does slow down after 1914. He does seriously go into depression again. But even a major paper like Scientific American, not a peer group, but there is a major publication. By 1916, when Lowell passed away, they were very much still aligned behind Lowell, saying that we know other people don't like this theory, but we're still behind it. Next case. In 1921, Vessel Slifer published his, I love the title of his paper, Photographing the Planets with a Special Reference to Mars. I don't know why there's an E in front of special, but this is actually in the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, so it's a serious peer review. Paper. Now it's hard to see on the screen, but he puts this out as photographs of the canals of Mars. One of my service speakers, this is actually published as photographs of the canals of Mars dating back to 1903. So Vesto was a very dedicated photographer, and even five years after his death, was still publishing papers saying Lowell was right. Of course, by now, especially with Lowell's theory, H.G. Wells, and of course, his other guy with the giant vegetables. Science fiction is now, this is the golden age of science fiction, the golden age of science fiction stories about Mars erupts, and there's all sorts of stories in the pulp fiction about life on Mars. Next, please. 
1924, in an attempt to put an end to the endless arguments, America declares a national radio silence day. Five minutes out of every hour, all radio stations and all communications in the United States have to stop. And the U.S. Navy launched a dirigible with a radio telescope aboard, a radio equipment, not a radio telescope per se, aimed at Mars. And for an entire day during radio silence day, they listened to Mars, hoping to hear the civilization. So this isn't anything new. This is all of America shutting up. Try to do that again. And the U.S. Navy taking it serious enough that we're going to try to listen in to see what the Martians are doing. Maybe we'll hear what they're talking about. I don't know if they actually said that last one, but they actually did want to listen on Mars. Next, please. <laughs> so the evolution of uh, science fiction is part of what's happening at the time. Even in Wonder Stories in 1934, I thought this particular story was very cool, Valley of Dreams. They weren't just aliens, they weren't just octop octopi or octopuses, or old words, right? They weren't just octopuses and spaceships. They were made out of silicon. And that was really exciting because people even then realized, yeah, you could base life on silicon. Not so much at our temperatures because it doesn't work very well. We have to move on Venus. But this guy writes a story about life on Mars based on silicon. There's a problem with that, which he gets right. If they breathe oxygen like us, what do you exhale? Not carbon dioxide, silicon dioxide. And the geologists in the room slid them dioxide with rock. And that's exactly what the Martians in that story exhale. They exhale bricks. So it's very ingrained in the society at the time that there could be very complex life on Mars. Of course, Star Trek also takes it. There's a silicon dioxide dude that Kirk stupidly tries to punch. Of course, he's made of a us and caught. Here's my trivia for the day. I should have asked about John Mitchell and Dark Star. Who are the two actors in this picture? Anybody? Name this guy. William Shatner. Right up. And who's that? And Janos Al Pacino. Al Pacino. Everybody recognize that one? <laughs> Yeah, that's when Al Pacino wasn't a big headline yet, so he had to do the rock song. Um, <laughs> but that was my trivia. It had nothing to do with personal goals. Next, please. Yeah, he <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gets you get your order. And the same guy also played gorillas in Billy Gonzalez. Excuse me. 1939. You want to know how much part of Mars was up in our society still? Orson Welles. Does a broadcast on October 1939 30, about the War of the Worlds. He reads a script about the Martians arriving just off the coast of New Jersey and invading. About 6 million people hear the broadcast, and about 1.5 million people actually panic, thinking it's a real invasion. Now, there's a question Did they think it was the Martians invading, or look at the date? Did they think it was Nazi Germany invading? That's never been clearly defined. Okay, who they thought was invading? But Orson Welles was talking about heat rays and cities being burnt to the ground. And so, wow, I mean, the Nazis would be really aggressive at being done. But who knows? It caused panic. I know my next door neighbor when I was a little boy. Uh, she was an older retired school teacher, very, very intelligent person. She heard the broadcast. They thought it was real. And dad went out and loaded the shotguns and the rifles because the Martians weren't getting their fun. So people took this for real. That's how ingrained the thought was of Martians that could be coming to get us. It was just meant to be a joke the night before Halloween, and it caused major panic. Next piece. Everybody probably knows their favorite cartoon, Martian, <laughs> Marvin Martian. I just put that in as a laugh because going right into the 40s and 50s and 60s, there's still quite a belief that there could be Martians. Uh, Marvin the Martian was actually called Anthony. Whether he was invented. Why? Whether he was invented. Because he looked like an ant and he acted like a twig. So that was his original name, but then it got changed and everybody loved Marvin the Martian and his dog, K9. The dog, of course, was the smarter of the two. Next. 1960s, the golden years of Martians invading on the Earth. This was actually on last night, but I couldn't bring myself to watch it. Some thought Trump was anointed. Even though I was doing this lecture today, I thought we still can with us 90 minutes watching that. I wanted to see Robinson Crusoe and his kids. Thought that was the coolest movie ever made. You know, what can I say? Next. Thomas Cave. For those people in the, in the room my age bracket will remember Cave was filled with telescopes. They were the epitome of Newtonian reflectors in the 1960s. They had all sorts of guidescopes and all sorts of accessories that were ridiculous. 
Thomas Cave sold thousands of completed telescopes up to the observatory class and tens of thousands of optical systems. And into the early 1960s, the ads for his telescopes actually said, and I quote, see the canals of Mars. Now, did he mean see the features on Mars? Or did you want to see the civilization building canals? I don't know. Thomas is long gone. We can't ask him. But he actually had that in his telescope selling campaign. Find my telescopes. You see the canals of Mars. Cool. Here's the end of the debate. Obviously, the narrative probes arrived in the 1960s. Of what do we see? We see something that looks like the moon. We don't really see straight lines and canals. Okay. Was it really the end of the debate? No, it kind of really is. Fair enough. Next slide. So, what caused the error? How do we have not only one observer, but many serious observers get it wrong? Next, please. So I'm going to present seven quick ideas. Some of them are personally mine from my own study of the situation, and some aren't. This should be really slide number two, but I'm going to leave it as number one. Current media events. Media spread very slowly in those days. It wasn't like now where you can see what the handball results are in the Philippines or from this morning. Oh, good, because I had money riding on that team. Not in those days. You're lucky if you heard about something weeks later. The current events around the time of personal Lowell was the construction of the Suez Canal. It talked about an enormous construction project. Thousands of people died on that. The initial survey was completely wrong. They had two heights of the little starting at Niagara Falls. Um, it's easy to get both over the falls. It's really hard to get back up. So they, they had to build a very long engineering system around it. So this was in the back of Lowell's mind, whether he realized it or not. These are the big media stories of the time. Construction of big canal systems. So what kind of jump is it from Earth to Mars? Little big canals. Next. Please. Expectation box. Okay, this is what everyone said. Everyone said, well, Schiaparelli, and all these other people saw canaling, they saw channels, they saw canals. So Lowell may have been kind of expecting to see canals, right? Back to the six-inch refractor and his 15-inch refractor at Harvard. If he's expecting to see them, you're going to see them. Can the observers on the staff expect to see them? Maybe. It's hard to say. Expectation bias can really, as you know, <laughs> skew your version of what you're looking at. But lots of observers saw them. Can't they not even take it in Douglas Social and National? Well, I can also cite a Montreal chapter. There's all sorts of drawings from around 1900 of their members drawing the Martian canals. They're in the archives. They're in Ottawa. You can look these pictures up. We have serious observers in this group, not in this room, but in our association, who quite seriously view the canals in Mars. Next, please. Cognitive dissonance. I want that job on set. I'm going to go for that interview. I really want that promotion. I didn't get the promotion. Well, thank goodness I didn't get the promotion because then I would have been higher paid bracket and would have had to buy suits. Cognitive dissonance is when your brain is forced to accept something that you're not happy about and rationalize your way through it. If you've taken psychology 100, 101, everybody learns about cognitive dissonance. And so when Lowell put a huge amount of money into that observatory, could he possibly fail? A psychologist will tell you, probably not. He was going to succeed no matter what, because that's how human beings rationalize big expenditures of money or big investments of time. He more or less has to succeed. He didn't succeed, because what's the option? option? Well, there's nothing there. It's paid. It wouldn't matter. He had thousands of other things to study. But that was the big thing in World War II with Mars. So it's quite possible that psychologically, he had to succeed. Next, please. This is what this, this theory came out in 2003, gained a lot of traction at the time. Improper equipment usage. Well, Lola admittedly had a 24 inch refractor, which was awesome, but sometimes he stopped it down to three inches. Why would he stop it down to the apartment size telescope? Well, he did it just to reduce air through the mist and reduce heat effects in the tube and so forth. You get a better image, well, better image, but a, but a lens that big rather than a long distance. So people said, when you stop down the 24-inch telescope to a 3-inch F120, it's like those telescopes we saw pictures of from the 16, 1700s, like 100 feet long. The problem is, unless you're critically online on dot with focus, you might see the inside of your eye. Have you ever been to the ophthalmologist and they look deep into your eye? While they're doing that, you can look in your eye well and you can see the map of your eye. Here's where that theory goes wrong. 
my eye it is turning once every 24 hours. Because Lowell was reporting the spin time of my eyes very, very accurately based on you know, the observation of features crossing the right across. Basically, the inside of his eye wasn't was rotating. So that theory, in my opinion, doesn't get any traction at all. Yes, momentarily, you can see the network of your eyeball. And you can mistake that for a very straight linear canal system. But when you look at that in three hours and four hours, it's going to look exactly like that. It's not going to move. So I don't, I don't give that particular theory very much traction. Next one. Another psychological or visual effect is spurious resolution. Just if you're looking at tiny features and they're close together or they're minusculely out of focus, black can become white, white can become black, things can appear blurred or double. It's just an effect of your eye and it's an effect of your neurology and your brain. Does that come into play? Quite possibly. We're looking at little tiny images of the planet that's millions of miles away. So spurious resolution is a possible explanation of the mobile scene. But again, other observers saw it as well. Next page. Shintoism is my own theory, and I put a lot of weight on this. Lowell was fascinated by Shintoism and life in Japan. He spent two years voluntarily there. In fact, he went on two of the three books about the time and worry. One was a cult to Japan. Lowell had a very dry sense of humor. I read a cult to Japan and there were several times when I burst out laughing and reading it. And not because I'm completely in the picture, because he has a very good sense of humor. He was fascinated by Shintoism. He decided he wanted to see the real Japan. Although he had an apartment there, a residence in Tokyo, he went to the other side of Japan and was in the middle of nowhere. He was like Marshall Towns in Nova Scotia, wanted to see Nova Scotia culture. Do they go to Halifax? No, they go to Quebec. Nothing against Quebec. I'm just simply saying, why would he go to the big city to see the culture? No, Lowell goes to the other side of Japan and he travels. And of course, he travels with extreme confidence. He travels with literally two railroad cars full of the smoke jackets and the tuxedos because he didn't know how to travel otherwise. He was a walking gentleman. He hired a young teenage boy who could speak some, uh, speak some Japanese and English to go a day ahead of him to make food and accommodation for him. This leads to a hilarious story of Lowell arriving in a little dotable town with a little guest house in the middle of the night, and he's exhausted. And this, the owner comes out and he's very proud to meet this American gentleman and says, Any ailments you have, you have to get into my spa and you'll feel better. And Lowell looked at this bubbly green mass of goo. And thought to himself, I don't have any ailments, but if I get into that tub, I'm going to come out with a lot. So he had to be very gracious with the Japanese homeowner saying, I'm so exhausted. Maybe tomorrow I'll get into that, whatever that is. But he loved going to little towns and seeing the local Shinto priests who would do weekly demonstrations of speaking in tongues or walking across hot coals and bare feet. And Lowell spent a lot of time examining these people. And they were very happy to have this American gentleman examine their feet and watch them do all these magic acts. And Lowell couldn't figure out what was going on. So he, he developed a very strong belief in Shintoism that everything has a living spirit. Uh, living creatures have a living spirit. My mug has a spirit and the camera has a spirit. That's one aspect of Shintoism, not everything. And so Lowell buys into that. So it's not hard for him to imagine another planet where life has sprung out of nothing, out of rock. So what apparently did here. But he didn't see anything wrong with believing that that could happen on other planets. And in my opinion, it has a lot to do with Shintoism. It's interesting that he also comments now the word cult had a very different uh, meaning before 1960 in this in American society. But he refers to his provinces as members of the cult who freeze on the mountain block, pursue silence, their only companion, and occasional story title. So he had a very dry sense of humor, and he had a very great interest in silence as well. So it's another story. Next phase. And my last point is simple human survival. When humanity came out of the trees four or five or six million years ago or before that, we wouldn't last very long if we didn't have the ability to discern patterns among patterns or see patterns where they aren't there. If we look at the constellations, what do we see? Patterns that aren't there. If we look at Orion's belt, if we look at the Pleiades, we see a real pattern. What do we do? Those are actually related to each other as well. Now, Look at Orion's belt, they're not related to each other, but what do we see? We see a pattern, because that's what the human brain does. We see patterns automatically. And it's probably a very ancient survival mechanism that I can look at a field of grass and realize that pattern is different than that pattern, and that pattern is probably going to have me for lunch if I don't get moving. So that's probably a, another part of 
the neurological process that was happening in uh, lower mice have seen patterns that may or may not have actually been there. There are other surface features on the books there are very deserts that you can see the department stores elsewhere. There are very large, as you saw in the earlier picture, mountain ranges, huge mountains that can be seen from Earth. It's a pattern. Next please. So I'm going to leave those seven points with you. This poster was driven by one of those seven, a combination of those seven features. I think expectation bias and cognitive dissonance had a lot to do with it, but Shintoism had something to do with it. On a personal note, just to tell you a little tiny bit about Percival Percival Lowell before I sit down. Um, the boy, as he called him, his assistant from Japan, he became a very famous uh, lawyer and author in Japan. And he was so devoted to Lowell, and I heard Lowell died. In 1917, he crossed the ocean, no small feat in the middle of the war, to come and visit and just pay his respects at Lowell's grave. So, traveling from Japan to America just to visit a grave site, that's a guy who was pretty dedicated to his former boss. His devoted assistant, Rexy Leonard, um, this is Lowell's assistant. There was absolutely no doubt that he knew about Brennan, about well, personal Lowell. He and Rexy were very much in the house. Anytime they were apart, they wrote each other very long. Uh, letters about the flowers in the snow and what the coyotes were doing, and so on and so forth. Rexy was also a very dedicated observer, and as such, she was memorialized by having a crater, Leonard Crater on the planet Venus, named after her, and also a story written Venus on Mars in 2014. The lead character is actually based on Rexy Leonard. We'll come back to Rexy in just a second. Next, please. Lola obviously wanted to marry Rexy. His brother pointed out to him, uh, first of all, Boston gentlemen do not marry their sisters. So that was driven into a little thing. And his two sisters, one is a very famous public author, and one was a very active person fighting for free legal rights. One of that was quoted at the height of Lowell's uh, fame as saying, my brother is a very, very smart man, but he's not a good man, all because of his association with Rexy. So Lowell did the right thing. Very late in life, in his 50s, he marries um, Constance Savage, who is allegedly a real estate developer. And when Lowell dies, uh, Constance fires Rexy the very next morning. As a matter of fact, has her forcibly removed from the property the very next morning. And then she finds out, much to her dismay, that Lowell's wealth was left to the observatory and trust to run the observatory while he's in Ireland. She's not amused by that, so she immediately fights him in the courts for 10 years. This cost half the estate. To gain the support of the judge, she pretended to be blind for the next 10 years. Anyway, so I'll leave your thoughts on that to yourself. There was not enough money to maintain the observatory after this legal fight. So Lowell's brother, uh, Leonard, put the money into the fund to keep Lowell Observatory running to this day. Next thing. I don't know if you can see, you can see where he took it there. I think this. Well, pretty well sums up, first of all, being an elderly man from, from Boston. The only excuse for dinner is just the garlic ball. Next day. So, Lowell Observatory today carries on and has made many discoveries which have changed the space of, of uh, astronomy. You know, obviously, the discovery of Pluto by Ron Byer was hired because he was such a meticulous observer and blogger. Pluto's atmosphere. In my opinion, Jessica Slifer and uh, George Annette discovered the expansion of the universe well before Hubble took credit for it, but that's just my two cents worth. The rings of Uranus, and of course, Lowell Observatory was used to map the moon very accurately before the uh, lunar landings. So it has done amazing work and continues to do amazing work. As I just mentioned uh, before I started this lecture, an associate of mine that I did my master's with was a medical doctor in New Zealand, who's going on. Tour today, he's a guest speaker on several cruise lines in New England. I'll just tell you a little bit about this, but I'm very happy to be here. You don't think you want to I'd rather be here than the Bahamas. Where the big one was. Anyways, he went to see the, uh, the solar eclipse a few weeks ago, and he was at Lowell Observatory. This is on Kingdom Lunch Show, and he took it. Get a picture beside the refractor. He takes a picture of himself standing beside some, I don't know, little toy telescope. That's not what I wanted. I wanted the big telescope, but anyways. Um, it's a very famous observatory. It's made some serious research in life in, uh, in the century. And so I hope, if nothing else, you realize that Percival Lowell, A, was an unsung hero, B, was a great observer, and C, was not an ego. He made some mistakes, but as I said, all sorts of mistakes get made. What happened to the steady state of the universe? I'm glad he thinks about the Big Bang Theory. 
what happened to 12 dimensional string theory? It talks about that in a cocktail party a little bit. They used to all the time, but not so much now. So he made a few mistakes, absolutely, but he definitely influenced Walter, and I think he was an amazing observer. And I want to thank you all for your time. One more slide, please. Oh, sorry. Two more slides. One more slide. Mark today, yes, we know that there are two general values of valleys that dwarf the valleys on this planet. And is there life on Mars? Well, Bill Clinton, who was president of the United States, heralded the discovery of life on Mars. It's a meteor from Calvin Hill, Antarctica, in which he was close to the one. It's proving that there was life on Mars. Is there a fossilized mammal bacteria? I'm not sure. We thought about it first. It could be just geochemical uh, artifacts, not from the rocks. It's hard to tell when you're dealing with tiny, tiny, tiny microscopic, sub microscopic fossils. Is it geochemical, you know, is it geochemical nature, or is it a is it a true fossil? The problem is things like this really indicate life and it's hard to tell. Where I used to live, we used to walk along a lake every day that have enormous fossils that look like enormous sushi Hawaiian plants. They're amazing fossils. I took pictures of them and sent them to my cousin the geologist. He said, well, not really fossils. They're trace fossils of worms, worm tubes. It's not a living thing you see, but it's trace fossils. I don't know. Is that a lot? Is that sign of life? Not, I don't know. He's got it written off now as probably not life. But a lot more study has to be done. So my final slide is it's quite possible that he was right. So you could clearly vindicate it. And I'm gonna stand beside behind Percival to the very end. Thank you very much, folks. So we prepared to do Q and A's. And so as I said, if you have any questions, Julie's gonna come up and field them. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding you. That wouldn't be my thing. Thank you. But uh, anyways. I can't imagine you having questions. It's just a general presentation of the most guy, in my opinion, that got a bad rap in life. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the evening. And thanks for being my remote. No problem. Is there a connection between the two or the two wells? Orson? No. No? No. no just a coincidence. Okay. And uh, that's it for the So we move on to our um, special presentation. Uh, for those in the room as well as uh, those outside, I don't know if you can oh, hold on, show my face. It's the 2024 RAS calendar at $25 um, for anybody that would like a copy. And the third edition of Explore the Universe, $20. If you send if people in the room, I'll take cash or check. And for those of you out in Zoom land or people in the room who want to go home and think about it for a while and want one, please send the uh, either the 25 for the calendar or the 20 for the ETU uh, to the treasurer, which is treasurer at halifax.rasp.ca um, to e-center. And please include what the money is for and a mailing address with your name because sometimes people's uh, email addresses are not their name. They don't have a clue who asked or at is. So please include your name, your mailing address, and it shall be sent. Thank you. All right. So um, before we uh, break for 15 minutes, uh, I'd like to uh, thank John for a fascinating presentation. I appreciate it. Uh, those of you in Zoom line, go make a cup of coffee or something. <laughs> We're going to take a 15-minute break here. Uh, for uh, biology and other stuff. Snacks. Snacks. Go ahead. Can talk. Hey, uh, today's poem was, uh, as I, as I uh, tried to uh, have the topic of the meeting, but uh, I, I wasn't aware of the meeting until after I wrote this, but uh, the full moon uh, and all the comments and the photographs on, on online, and especially Roy's comment about uh, the moon racing through the broken clouds uh, and the illusions and stuff uh, is the, the inspiration of this no, one. No, no, sorry. Is it okay to? Yeah, start? go ahead. Illusion. It's got a picture of the moon on A bright glow proceeds, then conjured it rises, swelling up into the skies. Wide eyed, it peers above its self illuminated line. That's right. And in a rush, pulls itself fully into the night. A glorious orb of sunset hue floats so large within a star blazing sky. Below, enhanced by vistas grand, 
Wonder and awe spreads with a sudden sight surprise. Yet does not his grin sit askew? Is there a secret known but only to a few? Perhaps this vision is not fully true. Then rising high, he dons a silver line, gleaming hue, wide, his wide shining smile shifts shadows down upon the ground. At times we marvel his swift running of the skies. As quick from broken cloud to broken cloud, he seeks his grace to hide. But for a silver shining halo, his swift run trail unveils. Yes, do we trust the smiling rabbit as he bows to all below? Does he hold the secret we should all seek to know? As night surrenders to the sun, his busy visage swells again to wonder. And with his grin once more askew, he drops rapidly from view. There comes a time when the question need, the question's need is asked. A hand outstretched, its smallest digit held fast upon wonder's vision, till illusion's mass unveils. With eyes assumption held to task, wonder's secret is revealed. Yet his grin askew, askew and rabbit's smiling bow, a secret deep seems still to hold somehow. For those of us who hope for wonders that enthrall, let not knowledge of eyes through sight keep you from the night. For when his grins askew and sunset orbs swell anew, Prepare yourself to dash along the rabbit's silver glowing half hidden paths. Let illusion fill your soul with joy. And we all know about the how the moon is so much bigger when it rises and sets. And uh, I, I agree with Roy's comments the other day about the watching the moon with binoculars as it races through broken clouds is just awe-inspiring. Just a phenomenal. You, you just feel like you're there. So that's sort of where that comes from. And there's the rabbit. Yeah, there's yeah. the rabbit. The yeah. rabbit. It's, yeah. not, it's not. What was the? What was the other? The the beaver. The pink rabbit. rabbit beaver. <laughs> the rabbit. <laughs> yeah. so, but the rabbit and the eyes. So. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Okay. <laughs> So next up is uh, news from the board with uh, Pat Kelly. Okay, um, so this is going to be a relatively short and brief report for everybody. Um, we have coming up on uh, a few things on the about the observatory. Uh, there's uh, recently and. Uh, First thing to report on there is that the road into the observatory is now passable with caution. Uh, they've got the road in, but it still has a lot of large rock in it. It hasn't yet been filled with the smaller gravel and graded, but you should be able to get in there to uh, to get to the observatory uh, as long as you are not trying to get in there, for example, with uh, a, uh, say, a Formula One race car. You might rip parts of it off, but for regular cars, you should be okay. We're also moving the lockbox down right next to the gate. For those of you who've been out there, uh, turns out that the uh, they're more than happy to let us put the lockbox uh, anywhere as we want. And we're actually in the process of replacing the lock that's there uh, at the, leave the gate actually into the observatory, which has gotten somewhat crusty over the years. And there are uh, plans in the future to start resuming the members nights. We used to have one once per month, generally around the time of the new moon where uh, new members or members who've never been out to the observatory, we would actually uh, set aside one night for people to come out and actually sort of see what the observatory is all about, assuming, of course, that the weather is clear. So look for more details on those in the upcoming uh, upcoming months. Uh, in terms of the astrophotography contest, uh, the biggest problem we've had there is not enough submissions. Uh, so as a result, there aren't enough pictures to have the typical three categories for awards. So what we've decided to do instead is to simply run with the People's Choice Award, 
which will go ahead. And again, uh, there'll be an announcement that will go with that will actually tell you how you'll be able to participate. Um, we're also hoping in the future to actually get more information out to other people uh, and other groups about the contest so that we'll actually have more entries. In terms of upcoming events, uh, for members meetings, we have January the 2nd, uh, 2024, February 3rd, March the 2nd, April 6th, I'll get to the question marks in a second, May 4th and June 1st. So those are the first Saturdays of each of the months. And they're in italics because unless I'm, unless I'm mistaken, I think we haven't actually gotten those dates confirmed yet from St. Mary's, but once they're confirmed, uh, we should be good to go. The April 6th one, uh, there, we're, there's some debate over what to do about that meeting because as you're likely aware on April the 8th, there's gonna be a total solar eclipse crossing New Brunswick, which means there's a good chance that most of the people involved in astronomy, uh, in fact, probably a good chunk of the population of Nova Scotia is probably gonna be in New Brunswick and PEI uh, for a few days to try and get a good view of that eclipse because this is the closest place you're gonna get a chance to view it um, for quite some time. Pat? Yeah. Dates you posted are board meeting dates. The first members meeting is January 6th. Oh, you could be right. Uh, just... February 3rd is correct. March 2nd is correct. April, um, I think we agreed to can the April meeting because of the eclipse. And May 4 is correct, and June 1st is correct. Okay, all fixed. Okay, so th there are the correct dates, and there is no actual April meeting. So hopefully we'll see lots of you in New Brunswick or PEI uh, for those of you who've just gotten your handbook, uh, the northern point of Prince Edward Island is the least likely place to have clouds anywhere east of the Great Lakes. So if you want to have a better chance of clear skies, you're looking at going uh, quite a bit further away than Prince Edward Island. So it just depends on, and of course it depends on the weather, um, but I expect if there's a, a, if there's a reasonable chance of good weather, on the day of the eclipse, you're going to see a lot of people making a one day drive to New Brunswick or BEI to try and see it. And that is it. Okay, well, thanks, Pat. Now we'll uh, see what's up. Um, so, we're to uh, December. The solstice is on the 21st at uh, 11 27 p.m. Yeah, I, I have a question there. Yeah. I, I've been going uh, looking for calendars, calendar books, and about half of them are saying December 20th. Mm -hmm. The Alhousie calendar says it's December the 20th. Right. And our calendar, of course, says December 21st, but going into the stores, about half the calendars are saying the 20th, others are saying the 21st. I'm just saying. Does anybody have an idea why it would be? They can see one place, one day you will forget. And that's only three hours. Because it's what, oh, you're ready in the afternoon is supposed to be the point. So I got that from um, the handbook. I got it from a website, the uh, Moonrise and Sunset. I think Nicole Mahello is supposed to. It's weird. Yeah, it is weird. Half the calendar is saying the 20th, but yeah, 27. Well, hang on. That's 11:27 standard time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> standard. What do you mean by standard? So it's 10:27. So good. UCC would be 227. It would be the 22nd. Yeah. Be 22nd. Well, I don't understand why it would be the 20th. Yeah. Some of the calendars that I'm looking in the stores, and some of them are saying the 20th, and others are saying 21st. I thought I was wrong. 
So the uh, sun looks like today. Lots of uh, sunspots. Uh, this one, uh, sunspot group AR thirty five hundred, uh, is the group that uh, is responsible for the near X class solar flare a few days ago, uh, which uh, should have given us. Uh, uh, Nice northern lights last night, except for clouds. <laughs> but I, I think Jason Dane, uh, he must have some lucky charm or something, but he did get a single shot before the clouds came in. And this was the Halifax. Uh, you know, that's nice imagery. Um, so uh, that grouping is, is moving out, and uh, What's currently coming in for its uh, face of the earth are, are, are fairly stable. Um, but you never know, there might be something coming up uh, into, into the view, rotating into view. Uh, we get another crack of the northern lights, maybe with uh, around the, the moon. Have you, you heard of the, if 3500 is going to last to come around? Because yeah. it's, it's acting similar to that one in 2003 that. Went around twice. Yeah, they, they might. There's, there's been at least one group I know of that went around uh, once and, and reappeared, but they renamed it. Yeah. Next is. Uh, so the uh, next one is mine. Um, last quarter uh, is uh, of the river streaming over moon is on the fifth. And uh, on the ninth, if you get up early, you can see the moon near Venus. Uh, it won't be a, no, as close as, as it earlier in November, but uh, it looks really close. Good binocular sight. And the new moon, the winter peak moon, will be on December 12th, followed by the peak of the Geminid uh, meteor shower on the 14th. So that's that should be quite spectacular. You can get to a area with dark skies with the new moon. Geminids are, are uh, indeed a pretty spectacular meteor shower. Uh, on the 17th, we have the uh, moon of Saturn, and the 19th, first quarter of the uh, winter slash peak moon. Jupiter near the moon on the 21st and 22nd, the 23rd, the moon of St. Cleves, and uh, another meteor shower of the Ursids on December 22nd. But the, the Zumbio. That, that's just before a full moon, so uh, you don't get to see the really brightest uh, meteors. And it will be on the 26th. I, I uh, found this today in uh, BBC Sky and Night Magazine and uh, thought I'd, I'd uh, put it up. It's between the 15th and the 25th of December, um, you can see how the, the moon follows the uh, Birthday and it winds up with different uh, planets uh, throughout the month. <laughs> it's kind of neat. Uh, the Saturn, Neptune, uh, Jupiter, and Uranus are all visible in the night sky. So, uh, now, last night, not only did we miss northern lights because of the clouds that appeared just after sunset, but this would have been a nice sight too. Uh, an 11 30 uh, with uh, 750 binoculars, you see the moon and the two black clusters in the field of view. But sadly, we for another time. Uh, this was December 9th, so Venus and the Sun of Crescent Moon. 
early in the morning, so that that's all I sit down and to get up. Yeah. 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 Thanks, uh, best uh, time to uh, look at lunar features or explore the universe is uh, around the time of the first quarter, so December 17th to the 21st. And uh, these are some features, uh, Mare and, and Craters. Uh, if you uh, try to observe three of them, uh, you'll get on to this. Uh, again, Geminid meteor shower. So it peaks the night of the 14th. Um, up to 120 meters per hour at dark site. I've, I've seen that range. Some people say 100, others say 550. So long, slow tracks. And uh, there'll be very little uh, moonlight to, to deal with because the waxing second moon will set it. So 715, the radiant in Gemini is above the horizon early. Um, it's kind of interesting that. The source, this is an unusual source of a, of a meteor shower. Usually, they're uh, meteor showers are as a result of the Earth passing through a comet's debris from a comet's tail. Um, the geminids uh, are the result of debris from, they call it a, a, a asteroid comet hybrid, the rocky comet. It's a little, a little unusual. Not a not a baseball, it's a larger rock. Uh, the planets in December. Um, Mercury is visible after sunset until about the middle of the month, but it's very low in the southwest sky. Uh, maximum eastern elongation will be on December 4th. Venus, uh, anyone who gets up uh, before sunrise uh, can't miss Venus. It's so prominent in the eastern morning sky. It's already uh, noted how it's close to the waning crescent moon at night. Mars is still too close to the sun to be visible. Jupiter uh, is prominent uh, at the start of twilight. And uh, something to keep in mind uh, there's a double shadow transit on December 23rd and the 30th. Check out the observer's handbook for the details on that. And as I said, on the 21st and 22nd of December, you can see these are the uh, waxing gibbous moon. Saturn is visible in the south southwest after sunset, um, close to the waxing crescent moon on the 17th of the month. But it, it's uh, sets uh, well before Jupiter. Uh, Uranus is visible all night between Aries and Taurus. Uh, Neptune is visible in the evening twilight onwards between Aquarius and Pisces. Uh, but, uh, we'll, uh, we'll set uh, at around midnight. Uh, so, this is a uh, binocular observing and perhaps a photo opportunity. The, uh, on the 14th, the very thin crescent moon and Mercury. Uh, Look at Sagittarius uh, around 5 p.m. You need a, a, a good uh, west southwestern horizon to see that. Uh, so, these are constellations uh, Orga, Gemini, Taurus, Orion, Cancer, Cancer, and Venus Minor. Look straight here so you can see all those in the uh, south uh, east. And, uh, Around 10 p.m. during the month, so don't stay up too late. Uh, this is a photo from uh, Dave Chapman uh, showing uh, two uh, winter asterisms, the uh, winter triangle, Procyon, Bellevue, and uh, Sirius, and the much larger winter hexagon. Winter stars that explore the universe. Uh, Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. Hello, uh, Rigel, Procyon, Betelgeuse, Aldebaran, all empty passing. So, again, pick those stars out in the winter constellations. Let's look at those. 
Uh, the uh, blue sky object for December is Pimble's Cascade. Right uh, here, well above M37 and the Hades. Here's the Cascade. And it ends in a uh, open star cluster in the C1502. Uh, double star. Uh, this is a, a fairly uh, easy one. Uh, data toward uh, it, it consists of two third magnitude stars. And it's quite pretty in the, the telescope. Theta one toward is uh, yellow. Theta two is blue. So they're uh, Theta one is 152 light years away. Theta two is 157. So this is a, uh, it's believed to be a true double. And that's it for the sense. Any questions? Guaranteeing uh, clear skies then? No. It hasn't been great so far. Just say yes, Paul. <laughs> yeah. As, as a matter of note, I was talking to Melody Hamilton the other day, one of our members, and she said, tell everybody, buy your equipment between now and December so that we have clear skies for the uh, solar eclipse. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, well, uh, that's it for today. Um, for uh, adjourn, I'd like to thank our uh, technical staff, uh, Gary and uh, Peter and Bob. Thank you. Thank you. So, see everyone in the day. Your stars. Take care.